ladies and gentlemen, Chad Taylor. All right. How you doing, Chad? I'm doing great. Oh, great. Thank you, Joe. Hey, have a seat. So, what has it been? You've been, it's been so long since you've been out here to Southern California. How long has it been? Oh, years, at least a dozen years. Dozen years. Well, you know, Chad and I, um, along with, I mean, along with a lot of the speakers, we've been talking for quite a few months. I think it's been like nine months now. Yep. And uh, we really developed a pretty good friendship, I think, mm -hmm. um, online. So this is my first time meeting a, a, all you guys. So it's been pretty cool. But you, we had talked a while ago, and you had made, made a mention about you're going to be doing another book. And so what's going on with that? Yeah, so I'm still working on it. It's not going quite as fast as I want it to, but it's going to be a children's book, actually, uh, tying into a lot of these subjects. And after having kids, it really puts so much more emphasis on what goes into my kids' minds, and it also really kicks me in the butt to try to plant seeds, you know, like be able to provide a resource to other parents that they can present to their kids at a young age to really get them to question, you know, this subject and then I really want to do additional uh, children's books uh, on other subjects as well just to get that seed of question for them. Very cool. Well towards the back of your book um, which is full of great information like I just can't go on and on um, more about that book. You pose a great question and uh, so I want to ask you that same question. So after this conference is all behind us and we all return back to our homes, what now? Where do we go from here? Yeah, that's a great question. So for me, especially if you guys are new to the subject, wanting to share this with other people is like, yeah, I want to go share this with my friends or my family. And I'm sure those of you guys in here, that, especially if this is new to you, you have people in mind that you'd like to share this with. Well, how do I do that? And I remember the first person I, after my wife, the first person who I shared this with, I remember being so extremely nervous to share this subject with them. And it's somebody I'm extremely close to. And so I think doing it, first of all, in a humble way is key, is in not trying to prove I'm right, you're wrong, here's why, but going about it in a very you know, uh, empathetic way where you're just asking questions because we were all ignorant on this subject and your friend is no different, your family member is no different. And in the back of the book, I do have uh, five simple steps that I say for sharing you know, it talks about sharing the book, but I'm coming at things from a, more of a biblical aspect of how to share how the Bible actually describes earth with people. Because I've, you know, when I first got started with this, my pastor, I tried to show him, hey, look at this verse, look at this verse, look, and expecting him to see what I saw. And he, he was a pastor and he still didn't see it. So until I drew everything out day one, day two, day three, as we're going to see, then he's like, wow, it clicked. And that's where, you know, I got all these images in the book is so people can see that. And so I just use the book as a tool. So that's, that's my two cents is just sharing the subject with people and being willing to have people talk bad about you, being willing to have people get emotional in your face or whatever. And because it's not about me, it's about, you know, it's about God, absolutely. And sharing uh, um, his creation, you know. Great. Thank you, Chad. So um, you can catch Chad several times a week. I love coffee with Chad. It's a great, great time. You, you talk about a lot of subjects, so you can check that out on YouTube. Um, Chad, your question, everything um, question is going to be, what does the Bible say about the earth? So um, in your Slido code is CT5, ladies and gentlemen, Chad Taylor. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. All right. Uh, you can find me on YouTube, Chad Taylor, Facebook, uh, Chad Taylor. I do have my Coffee with Chad podcast as well. And, and on that show, I like to talk about very controversial subjects in as upbeat of way as I can. And um, so, yeah, you can check me out on there. And I just became a dad, or excuse me, I just became a father before I uh, came down here. And actually, I already screwed up the joke. <laughs> we could talk about being a priest, a Catholic joke. Sorry, you know, it's, Paul said start with a joke. So anyway. <laughs> all right so the question is what is the bible to you now my goal with all this is to lift up god's word over man's understanding and so when men in white lab coats say this well what does god's word say you know and so my goal i and i know um we, we all have different paradigms with where we're at with how we view the bible all of us view this differently but that's my goal is to uplift what's in here 
and just how I live my life is over um, to uplift this. So help them demonstrate that the uh, Bible is trustworthy and help give a better understanding of God's creation. This last part brings us to a big question. If how the Bible describes creation is true, what else is? Now, in the Bible, it says God is above us. So is God really above us? Will the sun and moon stop shining? Will all the stars of heaven fall to the earth? And will Jesus really descend on a cloud for everyone to see? And lastly, will millions of people come out of their graves at once? Really. And so if you guys are coming from a non-biblical aspect or a non-Christian aspect, these are really, really heavy subjects. And even for those of us that have come up in this, these are heavy, heavy subjects that are, that are crazy to think about. So our perceptions. So all of us, every single one of us, walk around every single day with our own perceptions. Every one of us, they could be, you know, I grew up Democrat in a Democratic household. I'm a Democrat. I vote Democrat. And we all, and, 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 you know, we all view things certain ways. I grew up Republican. My parents are Republican. I vote Republican. I'm a Republican. And we all have these kinds of things, whether it's my dad, my dad was a Ford mechanic. He drove Ford trucks. And so guess what? I drove Ford cars and stuff, right? We all have these kinds of things. Some people are like, cats are better than dogs, you know? And that, so that might be one of those things. That, that's a joke. But anyway... <laughs> And so our perceptions are how we live our life. But there's one person that did not have false perceptions and false biases. And he came here and he was killed for trying to show others the right way to view things. Um, what do you mean? <laughs> and so our perceptions have been developed since birth. They help determine how we see our world, how we see others, how we see ourselves our beliefs, our understandings, and where did our views come from? Why do we believe the things that we believe, and when did it all start? When did we get these views that we have? When did we get these biases that we have? Whether they're true or not, or whether we think they're real or not. On the topic about Earth, and the subject why I'm up here, and why we b grew up believing that this you know, earth that we live on is a spinning ball in space. When did the subject all start? It starts since you're a tiny, tiny kid. Even before this, in school we learn about this, even though this is all pseudoscience. We see it on our lunch boxes. We see it in cartoons. We see it on TV. We have arts and crafts with it. I mean, turn on kids' cartoons. This stuff is absolutely everywhere. And all of this is CGI. All this is fake images that have already been talked about. But we see this every single day. Since before you can walk and talk, this is what we're shown. And so to expect us to think of this any different by the time we get older, it's ludicrous. We all have these glasses. Our Earth is a spinning ball in space glasses. This perception, and all of us have at one point walked around with everything we see about the Earth is a spinning ball. Everything we see about space is like we're shown on Star Trek and Star Wars. Movies, TV, it is everywhere. Why would we think any different? We've seen this our entire lives. And that's what we're dealing with. We're dealing with the fact that our friends, our family, ourselves at one point or another viewed everything and viewed our world through these lenses. And we have to understand that when we talk to people and we try to expect them to see what we're talking about, they're viewing it through these that have been formed since before they could walk and talk. And the older they are, typically the more founded these are. And so that's why I applaud so many people that you know are 60, 70, 80 and above that realize how deceived they've been because they've seen such heavy, heavy events. And are we seeing some things through views that are not God's views? It takes humility to be able to examine ourselves and admit we may be viewing something wrong. 
And how do we know that? Some of the best examples we have of this are kids. And I know when my, when my son, for instance, when he's misbehaving or he's doing something that he shouldn't be, you know, I can sit him down and explain, hey, you know, please don't treat this person like that. Here's why. And I can sit him down and I can watch these, these perceptions that he has just like, oh, okay, no big deal. It's amazing how kids are like that. And didn't Jesus use kids as examples? Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, which really brings us to the subject of humility and pride. And I used to view pride as a pair of these lenses that we look through. These are prideful lenses. I, and, but what I've come to realize is that pride is the glue that keeps these perceptions stuck to your face. That's pride, is, is God will allow us if we dig in our heels and say, oh, this is how it is, and I, I'm super prideful, and I don't really care what this person says, or whatever it is, you know, he'll allow it. And humility, to me, is the solvent that will dissolve that glue, where we can actually pull these off. And will there be a day that none of us wear these glasses? So I want to share a couple things here that are very, very promising, uplifting uh, scriptures here. So, dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not been made known to us, but we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. That's pretty amazing. And it will happen in a moment, in the blink of an eye, when the last trumpet is blown, for when the trumpet sounds, those who have died will be raised to live forever, and we who are living will also be transformed. And this is how I picture it. This is an image from my book, Slightly Modified, where, you know, during this time, sometime in the future, whenever that is, you know, we leave these false perceptions behind. And uh, I'm, you know, personally looking forward to that day. Uh, until this day comes, we have to work on these. And I think just going, oh, no, I, I don't think I have any of those. That's probably another pair of these. You know, all of us have these to work on. And that's where the, the humility comes in. And when I talk to people, being doing what I'm doing, I've talked to you know, countless people, and I do see a big difference between humble people or people that are willing to kind of you know, bite their lip at least before just you know, coming at you, and people who will just jump off the handle, you know, like Jared talked about last night. So a big turning point in my life and a, a big event happened back in 2009. I don't know darken that for a sec. So back in 2009, I, uh, let me give you a little bit of backstory. Um, I'm extremely passionate about music. I've always grown up wanting to write music and play music for most of my life. And so I ha had a um, recording studio at my house and I was basically going up to my eyeballs in debt, going nowhere with something that I was super passionate about. And that was going nowhere, living in a small dumpy house and then I started a second business on the side, and then I was also working a job, and I was really, really frustrated with where I was at in life. I had all these ambitions and all these goals, but it was not where I wanted to be, and I was super frustrated. And I was also helping my parents build the house with my brother. And so there's a day in 2000, this was 10 years ago, and I go, you know what, I gotta get out of town. I just, I'm gonna take my dog. I had a beautiful brindle, 110 pound pit bull named Dime, named him after Dime Bag Daryl from Pantera, if you guys are familiar. Awesome dog, I, you know, and so it was just, I was a, a single guy and I trained that dog, you know, for hours every day. He was just a, a fabulous dog, so it was just me and him. And I go, we're gonna go off in the woods. And at the time I was living in Northwest Montana and I said, let's, let's get going. So I, I literally spent like this amount of time going, okay, where are we gonna go for a hike? Uh, here. And, just dropped what I was doing. It was a spur of the moment decision. And we went off in the middle of the woods in, in the Great Bear Wilderness. And uh, I used to hike to mountaintops is where I would usually go. And so it just me and my dog, and this is prime grizzly country. This is, if you hear of grizzly attacks, it's like right where we went. That's in Montana. <laughs> anyway, so it's just me and him. And we went up there and I was just like, you know what, I'm bringing my Bible because I feel like God, like, this is a time, this is a big turning point for me in my life where I'm going to get closer to God. He's going to speak to me. It just felt like this is the moment, right? And so he and I go up, we hike up this mountain. I'm in my running shoes, and this is uh, late spring, and I forgot there's still snow up there, so I'm hiking through snow and running shoes to the top of this mountain. Get there right as it's getting dark, and 
and set up, quickly set up my tent, and, I, and I'm sitting there by the fire, you know, just got my, uh, just me and my dog sitting there and warming out and just watch, this, watch the sunset and the beautiful sky, and I'm just like, wow, this is incredible. Set up the tent, and then this is what I want, want you guys, imagine this. Hundreds of thousands of acres, and there's almost nobody out there, and all I see is mountaintops, you know, all covered in snow still, just extremely beautiful country, and knowing that there is very few people out there. And so this is what it's like. So the next day, and I got pictures of this, and this is a hike I went on that I documented. For some reason, I never took pictures on other hikes except for little, the little disposable cameras. On this hike, I actually had a digital camera. I took tons of pictures. Imagine why. So I wake up. I wake up the next morning, and I just I do the David Hasselhoff pose, and I'm just like, open the open the tent, and it's just like, that's what I wake up to. It's just so beautiful, and just like, I just sat there, just took it in, it was incredible. And I get up, and you know, I say hi to my dog, because he stayed outside the tent, and <clears throat> I grab my Bible, I'm like, oh man, this is the moment, this is the moment that I've, you know, I'm waiting for this, I'm waiting, you know, for God to speak to me on this, and just, where do I start? Where do I start? I don't know what to do. So I'm like, well, let's start in the beginning. Why not? Genesis 1, why not? That's kind of silly, why not too? So I go, okay, here we go. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was a formless void, and darkness covered the face of the deep. Okay. Well, a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. Oh, wait, wait, hang on a second. I forgot, I was wearing these. That's right. Oh. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and that God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and there was evening and there was morning the first day. Okay, I think I can follow that. And God said, let there be a dome in the, a dome. And God said, let there be a dome in the midst of the waters. Let it separate the waters from the waters. And so God made the dome and separated the waters that were under the dome from the waters that were above the dome. And it was so. What? The dome. Okay. God called the dome sky, and there was evening, and there was morning the second day. I'm not kidding. Just that couple of verses right there, I must have spent half an hour reading that over and over and over. And God said, let the waters under the sky be gathered together into one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth and the waters he gathered together he called seas. And God say, saw that they were good. Then God said, let the earth put forth vegetation, plants yielding seed and fruit trees of every kind on earth that bear fruit with the seed in it. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants, yielding seed of every kind, and trees of every kind, bearing fruit with a seed in it, and God saw that it was good. And there was evening, there was morning the third day. But where is the sun at here? And what is this dome thing? There's plants growing without the sun, and there's a dome with water under and above it. This makes absolutely no sense to me. And God said, let there be lights in the dome of the sky to separate the day from the night. Let them be for signs, for seasons, for days and years. And let them be lights in the dome of the sky to give light upon the earth. And it was so. God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day, the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. God set them in the dome of the sky to give light upon the earth, to rule over the day and over the night separate the light from the dark, and God saw it was good. Can you see why I was having a problem up there? I'm, I'm waiting for God to speak to me and waiting for this revelation, and all it felt like was he came up and went poof, right in the guts. But in hindsight, that was direction. It was, hey, here you go. You're ready for this now. And it just turned me and set me on a course. Because I came back from that mountain, and I started asking pastors, and I started asking people, and I started being really attentive 
to how, what is this dome thing? Other translations say firmament. What is this firmament thing? And when I, all I got was dismissive answers and dismissive responses from people I expected to have answers, I'm like, what is going on? So has that been your guys' experience too? You know? And so it's like they don't know what they don't know. Most pastors you talk to still will give the best answer they think they have, but it's unfortunate. So day six is when the land animals and mankind shows up. And, uh, they, oh, by the way, this is out of the book too. Day seven, God rests. So, yeah, in hindsight, you know, what at the time felt like a super negative experience, because I walked down the mountain that day going, a dome in the waters, a dome in the waters. I was so frustrated, but it was that frustration and that seed that was planted that just kept me going and kept me going. And then it was um, after that, years later, I was studying, you know, giants and eschatology, you know, the study of end times. And I was giving a presentation to a small church group about giants and eschatology. And right about that time, so it was June of 2015, I came across some of Rob Skiba's uh, early videos on this, on this subject. And then he was referencing Mark Sargent, who was just up here. And thank you, Mark, by the way, if you're in here. <clears throat> and it was when I got to the bird wall video that he had, because... Admiral Byrd in Antarctica, where I'm like, wait a second. I remember years ago hearing the subject of the U.S. and Russia shooting missiles straight up into the sky. And I go, ding. That was my moment where it, it like clicked for me. And then pouring back into, you know, study of the Bible and going, okay, what does this really say with all of this, you know, new information? And so I want to get through uh, some of the uh, descriptions of earth and its surroundings here out of the Bible. Now, there's 101 examples out of the book of how the Bible describes earth. And for every one that's in here, there could be multiple more that, are, that could be added in here. It'd be a lifetime, I really believe it'd be a lifetime, if not multiple lifetime goal to put every single example that could be in there. I actually had 130-something examples I had to whittle down because of redundancy. Um, even then, it's awfully redundant. But so I think, yeah, I'm going to have to follow along here. The screen's a little small. So I just so every every example has four different Bible versions in it: uh, King James version, NIV, ESV, and NRSV. NRSV is this one that I had with me on the mountain that day. That's the one I grew up with. Because some people will say, oh, it's just this version that says that. It's just that version that says that. No, it's every version that I've looked into describes the same thing. And I actually, when I started writing the book, I wanted to have about eight different Bible versions, but there wasn't room to put eight in here. Not with the images, anyway. So I'm just going to skim through and uh, just give some, some of these descriptions. And Joe, how much time do I got left? Uh, 35 minutes. Okay. Perfect. All right, so I'm not going to do any particular version. I'm just going to rattle off some of these because I want to get through quite a lot of these. So uh, he raises up the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes and inherit a seat of honor for the pillars of the earth and are the Lord's and on them he has set the world. So the world is set on pillars. And this is the order of part two and part three is from Genesis to Revelation. So it's in that order that you'll find these examples in here. So, uh, or darkness so that you cannot, so that you cannot see a flood of water covers you. Is not God high in the heavens? See the highest stars, how lofty they are. Therefore you say, what does God know? Can he judge through the deep darkness, thick clouds and wrap him? so that he does not see and he walks on the dome of heaven. And on page four, like we already talked about on day two, the firmament was called heaven. It was also called sky. And so God is up there, high in the heavens, walking on the dome of heaven. Or is it just an allegory? So he stretches out the north over the empty place and hangeth the earth upon nothing. This is one of those. I used to give two examples out of the Bible of how 
the Bible describes some spinning ball in space. And that's pretty much as this one and Isaiah 40, 22, the circle of the earth, right, is pretty much the only two that anybody could ever use to maybe try to convince somebody that there's a ball spinning through space in the Bible. But when you take these into context, they absolutely go hand in hand with everything else we're going to see. Uh, he hath compassed the water with bounds. So there's boundaries around the water. So the pillars of heaven tremble and are astonished at his reproof. And what you can see here is this is just a representation of God up here on top of the firmament where he walks. And these are simplified images, obviously not to scale, but just to give basic examples of what is being described over here. Well, what would that look like over here? Obviously, grizzly bears aren't that big. <laughs> but anyway, so God gets angry up here, shakes the firmament, the dome. Down here, it shakes the pillars of heaven, which shake the earth. And we see many times throughout the Bible, the heavens shake and the earth trembles. The heaven shakes and the earth trembles. And, you know, I have little kids. When I want to get their attention, well, my boy, really, when I want to get his attention, sometimes I go, hey, hey, hello, you know, to get his attention. And you don't think our Heavenly Father might do something similar? Maybe. So the descriptions here, right up there on the top right, the north is stretched over the empty space. And that, so for me, the, a lot of times the north refers to like what's directly at the highest point of this ferment, of this dome. Yes, the north can cer is certainly referred to what we would normally consider like the center, but it seems to me more specifically, biblically speaking, the north refers to like, this area right in here. And the north being over empty space leads me to believe with other verses that the highest star that we see in the sky is significantly lower than the, the uh, very tippy top of where the firmament ends, which would give it certainly many, many reasons for why people way out here at the ends, say of South America, they can't see the North Star because they're significantly lower in the sky. But when Jesus descends in the future, he's going to be significantly higher and you'll be able to see through that angle there. Um, that, that's actually covered later in the book as well. I just don't know if we're going to get that far. Earth is not hanging from anything. It is set on pillars. He inscribed a circle on the face of the waters, and there's a boundary around the waters called the icy boundary, a.k.a. Antarctica. Uh, heaven has pillars, and they can shake at God's anger. So, do you know the balancing of the clouds, the wondrous works of the one whose knowledge is perfect, you whose garments are hot when the earth is still because of the south wind, can you like him spread out the skies hard as a molten mirror? Out of the north comes golden splendor, around God is awesome majesty. So, out of the north, you know, like the, this reminds me of the northern lights. I think most people would probably think that's the northern lights uh, being described. And so, what are we told the northern lights are versus what may they actually be, you know? It's really interesting to think about. Um, so the descriptions here, God spread out the sky. It's described as being hard and strong. It, can also, it is also described as being like a cast metal mirror. Um, all right, this one's really interesting. So people ask, well, okay, so if the earth is sitting on foundations, what's under the foundations? That's a pretty good question, I think. So let's, let's read what God said to Job. And this is... Uh, where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its dimensions, or excuse me, its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? So like, these are construction terms, like a tape measure. Who did the measuring line across it? On what were its bases sunk? So like the foundations, what are they sunk into? Or who laid its cornerstone? So the first uh, part of the foundation, you could say, when the morning stars sang together and all the heavenly beings shouted for joy. I think there's a lot you can take out of this, but basically this is God humbling Job, saying, you don't know these things, so why are you being so boastful, basically? And so, to me, this is God saying, you don't know, we don't know, and in this lifetime, we probably will not know what the foundations of the earth are set on. We're certainly not flying through space. The earth is certainly not moving. The, the question is, well, what's under that far? And your guess is as good as mine. You know, I do have some, some guesses, but they're just purely speculation on that. Uh, and one other thing to take into account, too, is the morning stars singing in this. 
Well, the morning star, as it talked about on day four, were placed in the firmament, so they didn't have to necessarily be created that day, but they were placed in that day. Just a side note, it's worth mentioning. So, um, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Uh, I'm going to have to keep going quicker. He... In them he has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom, leaving his chamber like a strong man, runs its course with joy. And so consistently throughout the Bible, it's going to be the course of the sun, moon, and stars. They run their course. The earth is always described as being fixed, immovable. It can shake. It can certainly shake. It has shaken. It will shake more. In the future, it talks about an earthquake that is unlike it, that every island and mountain will be removed from its place, you know, at some point in the future, there's going to be an earthquake like that. Um, so, you cut openings for springs and torrents. You dried up ever-flowing streams. Yours is, is the day. Yours also the night. You established the luminaries and the sun. You have fixed all the bounds of the earth. You made summer and winter. Another version, you have fixed all the boundaries of the earth. It is you who set all the boundaries of the earth. Thou hast set all the borders of the earth. On a spinning ball, what sense does this make? But it makes complete sense when you take everything into context. Um, when the earth totters with all its inhabitants, it is I who hold its pillars steady. Uh, just countless ones. And this does become redundant. And I think it's for a reason, because it is for 1,500 years, all the 66 books approximately, from Genesis to Revelation, it is a consistent theme all the way throughout, covering 1,500 years. And Matt, you did a fantastic job, by the way, talking about the trustworthiness of all that. Um, let's see here. The Lord is king. He is robed in majesty. The Lord is robed. He is girded with strength. He has established the world. It shall never be moved. And I, I must emphasize, too, is there is a difference between the world moving and the world shaking. A lot of people will try to say, well, see, it shakes, so it moves. Well, it's like, imagine if there's a, you know, a good-sized earthquake here, like right now, and then it stops. Could you have a surveyor come out and say, did, the, did that building move? Well, no, it's still sitting in the same place, but it was just shaking. So there's kind of a difference. And so certainly there's nowhere you're going to get that the earth is moving, especially with how we're taught growing up with our glasses on. So let's see. He looked down from his holy height. From the heaven, the Lord looked at the earth. And consistently, there's going to be thousands, there's got to be thousands of examples where it's up, down, ascend, descend, from above, from below, the, all these up, down, you know, examples that are super duper consistent. And in the flying through space heliocentric model that we're taught that's ever expanding, so meaning God is going further and further away from us every single day, you know, where is God in all of this? Well, throughout the Bible, it is extremely consistent descriptions of, you know, up and down. Uh, the heavens stretched out like a tent. This is uh, about uh, Noah's flood here. He set the earth on its foundation so that it should never be moved. You covered it with a deep as with a garment. The water stood above the mountains. Uh, for your steadfast love is higher than the heavens. And then, O oh God, above the heavens, let your glory be over all the earth. So that's where you got, you know, over all just, and this, this is, you know, I have a lot of parents that use this book for, as part of their curriculum uh, for their homeschooling. I have tons and tons of parents. So it's, kids get this stuff. Kids can go, oh yeah, that makes sense, above, yeah, okay, like, no big deal. And it's us that complicate these things in, in general, maybe not us in this room, but people in general, because we have to complicate them to fit our paradigm, to fit our views that we're seeing it through. It's amazing watching even creationist pastors that I would probably agree with on almost every other subject battle this subject. And I don't understand why it is so difficult to understand the world has been lying to us. Why is it so hard to get through? So, because they're wearing these. And maybe it's a hum humility versus pride subject as well. Um, Praise the Lord, praise the Lord from the heavens, praise him in the heights, praise him all his angels, praise him all his hosts, praise him sun, moon, praise him stars, all the shining stars, 
Praise him, you highest heavens, and you waters above the heavens. So you can see consistent heights, heaven, um, waters above the heavens. This is after the flood. This is one of my favorite ones, where in Proverbs, when he established heavens, I was there. When he drew a circle on the face of the deep, when he made firm the skies above, when he established the fountains of the deep. Other ones, when he set a compass upon the face of the deep, you know, compass. And when I read this growing up, I always pictured like, you know, I was a Boy Scout. I remembered like the magnetic north type of compass. But the traditional sense of the compass is like that, where two sticks joined at the, you know, intersecting point to draw circles. When he set a compass on the face of the depth, when he established the clouds above, when he made firm the skies above, uh, you know, about the firmament, the dome, when he established the fountains of the deep, which uh, is in uh, Noah's flood, when he assigned to the sea its limit, talking about the icy boundaries, I like to refer to it, or AKA Antarctica. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep moving uh, quickly here. I'm going to start uh, just... See, uh, by the way, do you know of any you know, secret society stuff that uses kind of imagery like that as well, like with a compass? You know, I mean, you wonder if that... If they're trying to flaunt something. You know. So the sun hurries back. This is in Ecclesiastes. The sun hurries back to where it rises. The, the perspective of the sun, just like I said too, as far as you know, the sun, moon, and stars being so much lower. And that's where the, the sunrise perspective, it goes out of our sight, just like a plane would go out of our sight you know, at some point. And then, or come back into our sight at some point. You know, that's what the sun and moon do. Um, and then all the stars, you know, will fall to earth in the future. So they're certainly, I know other people talked about the subject. They're certainly not, you know, flaming balls. According to the Bible, you know, right here, they're certainly not big flaming balls that could engulf the earth. Uh, there's nowhere in the Bible you can, you can gather that. So the heavens stretch out like a tent to live in. From above the circle of the earth, we seem like small grasshoppers, uh, like in... Um, was that Numbers 13, 33, about the view from the giant's view to us, it, talk, it gave a same kind of description because being so high up, you know, people look like grasshoppers to the giants. Well, God, you know, it's something similar to that just because he's above us looking down. Uh, a, a consistent theme, it's not 100% of the time, but it's more often than not, where it talks about the heavens are stretched out and the earth is spread out. The heavens stretched and the earth is spread Many, many examples of that. It's not everyone, but it's, it's more often than not. So, God laid the foundations of the earth. Uh, he got stretched out the heavens, under the heavens. Um, same, another one of many examples where the heavens shake and the earth trembles. Uh, Amos 9.6. I forget who covered this yesterday. I think Robbie did or somebody did. Um, Talking about the same same thing. Like I said, there's redundancy. It's over and over and over, you know. Uh, at His right hand in the heavenly places, far up, far above all, with Jesus and the Father. Spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. This is where I wonder the whole idea of black holes. Is there, you know, apparently you can see things that absorb light or whatever. I just wonder if what we're talking about when we see black holes or something in there with telescopes. What if it's just the spiritual forces of evil? You know, in, in John chapter 1, it talks about the, the darkness and the light, and the dark did not perceive the light. And I just wonder, you know, if that's something to it, because in the future it talks about when Jesus descends, or sometime thereabouts, there's going to be, um, like, war in the heavens. And, and I, I don't want to misquote that, but there's... Um, it's briefly talked about in here with other examples. So there's, it seems like there's good and bad spiritual forces, you know, in the heavens as well. Like the prince of the power of the air is certainly a negative spiritual force. So anyway, coming down to us from God, our Father from above. Part three. So these are clues about earth and biblical stories. These are stories like the sun, sun and moon stopping in the sky, you know, or other examples of stories that how do they tie into what we've already covered. And so this one, Noah's flood, for instance, the, the three uh, water sources you know, in Noah's flood, which the windows of heaven, that's a, this, if you say windows of heaven, typically most people will think of Noah's flood. 
And that's a great example. And so we have to extremely allegorize the subject because the windows of heaven are talked about many, many times. And the windows of heaven um, have opened and will open again in the future. At some point, they certainly will. And um, there's that. Under the hole, here's another example where it talks about all the high mountains under the whole heaven. Remember on day four, the firmament is referred to as heaven under the whole. And also, before I forget, when we read the word heaven in the Bible, we have to understand there's examples where the birds fly in the heaven, uh, the sun, moon, and stars are in heaven, the firmament is also called heaven, and then the highest heaven is this area up here, biblically speaking. So when you see the word heaven, it's important to say, well, which heaven is this referring to at this point? Um, just, just a side note I want to point out. Uh, and in this instance, under the whole, it's under the, you know, any one of them, really. So, all right. This is the sign. I think the rainbow is a fabulous question for getting people to question. Well, you know, why is a rainbow shaped the way it is? That's a great starter question. You know, ever think about that? Why is it shaped like a dome? All right. Um, Tower of Babel. People scattered abroad over the face of the earth. God came down, up, rained down from the Lord of heaven. Jacob's ladder, a ladder whose top reached the Lord and heaven above, you know, in a vision. God went up from Jacob. Their cry rose up to God, and the Lord came down. The Lord came down in a cloud, you know, and the Lord came down in a pillar of a cloud. And just notice the redundancy just consistently. So there is currently a debate about the shape of the tent tabernacle in the wilderness. Some say it was a rectangular shape. Others say it was a dome shape. Both are shown above. That's why it's the rectangular shape and a dome shape uh, tabernacle. I would, check, uh, I would encourage you guys, if you're interested in that subject, a Andrew Hoy is the guy to check out, Project 314. Um, and how he shows that the, the tabernacle is actually most likely dome shape. Uh, let's see. Unless thou lift up thine eyes unto heaven, same thing, hole under, the Lord cast down great stones from heaven. And I used to, as a kid, I used to hear stories about, oh, God throwing these stones from heaven. So is he just out in some galaxy far, far, far away and just kind of lobbing you know, rocks at us or something? Or maybe he had to send those things on their courses you know, during the Big Bang or something to know he was going to hit at that point. Wow, he's amazing. You know, I'd have to kind of twist things. Or is it literally he's just throwing them down from heaven, like, like it actually says? Um, the Most High parted the heavens and came down. This is one of my favorite images here. The earthquakes, you know, heavens shake, the earth uh, trembles. And also when the heavens are parted, it seems to me like, we also read about when, um, right before Jesus descends about this, the, the firmament, it says the sky will be rolled up like a scroll. And I just wonder if that act is a violent act where it's not like, uh, uh, where it's more forceful and that act of that will cause tremendous shaking. And in, at that point is where the, the islands and the mountains shake from their place. It's just kind of a speculation, pure speculation. But at this point, you know, it talks about imparting the heavens and came down. And at that point, time, you know, there's a massive earthquake uh, in this example. Um, even the highest heaven cannot contain God. The earth quakes and its pillars tremble under the whole heaven from the end of the earth, the corner of the earth. Uh, this is a good one from Job about, have you commanded the morning since your days began and caused the dawn to know its place so that it might take place, might take hold of the skirts of the earth so skirts, the rim periphery or environs of an area. So you can picture like some kind of skirts of the earth and then, uh, and the wicked will be shaken out of it. It is changed like clay under the seal. And you just picture clay being pressed under a seal. I mean, this is kind of no brainer. Like you could let an eight year old read this and they go, yep, yep, I get it. And I think that's how it's meant to be. I don't think you have to be some scholar to be able to, you know, read your Bible. Uh, we cannot comprehend the height of heaven. Height, 
Uh, and this also cannot comprehend the depth as well. This one's, this one's one of my favorite, Ecclesiastes. So the, the wisest man that has ever lived or ever will live from the way I understand King Solomon, it says, so he wrote uh, Ecclesiastes, right? So in the King James Version of Ecclesiastes, under the sun is used 29 times, under the heaven is used twice, and under heaven is used once. So all these right here are the different v verses in Ecclesiastes <laughs> That, it, that under the sun, under the sun, under the sun, under the heavens is used from the wisest man that ever lived. I think he may have known a thing or two. Uh, from, the four, from the four quarters of the earth, you can see the four quarters. Um, the heavens shake, tremble, stars give off no light. Uh, this one's really interesting. This is uh, Isaiah 14, 12 through 15. So the order that this is described, and this is talking, I, if I remember right, it's God talking to Satan here, and it says, how you are fallen from heaven, O shining star. Some say, O day star, O morning star. Uh, King James says, O Lucifer, son of the morning, you have been thrown down to the earth. So just picture the directions here. Thrown down to the earth. And that's why I have all these uh, dictionary definitions. I forgot to mention this. So all the, any words that are underlined here, they have the dictionary definition that goes along with it. So if you want to know what the definition of the word down is, the definition's over here. And it's just because in simple terms, it's, let's not overcomplicate this. Do you guys know why when geese fly above, when you can see geese flying when they're migrating or whatever, do you know why one side is always longer than the other? You guys know why? Because there's more geese on that side. <laughs> you know? Let's not overcomplicate this. You know, it's just, let's read the descriptions here. Okay? So, all right. You have been thrown down to the earth, you who destroyed the nations of the world. For you said to yourself, I will ascend. So, from down to up, right? That's what he's saying. I will ascend to heaven and set my throne above God's stars. Same direction, right? I will proceed on the mountain of the gods far away in the north. Like I said, it, it, this is more than, there's more examples than this, where significantly north a lot of times is referred to in this general area. The mountain of the gods far away in the north, I will climb to the highest heavens, right? Highest heavens, and be like the most high. Picture it, most high. Right? Instead, you will be brought down to the place of the dead, down to its lowest depths. So I just have simple descriptions of those directions, you know, ascending, descending. And the mountain of the gods far away in the north is a really interesting subject. And that's why right there I have Revelation 8, 8 question mark. Because if you look in Revelation 8, 8, it talks about a great fiery mountain falling into the ocean, Right? Well, before that, it's talking about things from heaven, from heaven falling to earth. And after Revelation 8, 8, it talks about things falling from heaven to earth also. It doesn't specifically say where this mountain comes from. But I'm just one, this is pure speculation. That's why I put question mark. Because what if after the sky, you know, rolls up like a scroll, that allows room for this great mountain to fall? Pure speculation. I don't know, just a side note. That's, I just want to... That's why I put just a little tidbit, Revelation 8, 8, question mark, so people can go on their rabbit, you know, on their journey to see if, what I'm talking about there. Okay, this is one where it talks about him. He punishes the host slash gods in the heaven, the little g gods. So at some point uh, in the future, this is how I read it, he's going to punish all, you know, all the, the wicked, uh, you could say fallen angels, demonic stuff, whatever, the host um, in the heavens. There's other versions that talk about his sword, something about a sword being bloodied in the heavens or something to that effect. Um, rolled up like a scroll. You know, this is uh, Isaiah. I mean, some of you guys would know the time frame of Isaiah when that was written versus when Jesus was around, you know, and the t I'm sure you guys know better than I do the time frame. But he's saying the same thing that is said in the New Testament as well. This guy rolled up like a scroll. And that's where I wonder, it says, you know, so as um, lightning shines from east to west, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. I wonder if when this sky rolls up like a scroll in the future, if that's going to be rolled up from the east 
to the west. Just, uh, just wondering. Uh, this is uh, Isaiah 38, where the sun stops in the sky. It goes back 10 degrees, and then it, at some point goes forward again. So the sun stops. In this instance, it would make sense in our traditional heliocentric spinning ball model. It makes absolutely no sense. You know, it'd be absolute catastrophe on the Earth, uh, to say the least. So looking upward to heaven and the starry host, uh, the Lord will be your everlasting light. In the, uh, talking about future events. All right, let's see. Rend the heavens and come down. So the heavens torn open. This is another thing. Oh, that thou wouldest rend the heavens, that thou wouldest come down, that the mountains might flow down at thy presence. Mm. That definitely sounds like a Revelation talk there. Um, so Jeremiah 49. So this is from the quarters of uh, heaven. From, yeah, from the four quarters of heaven. Ezekiel. This is another one of my favorite images. You know, about the cherubs. With the, it looks like the... Uh, and above the ferment, here, check this out. So over the heads of the living creatures, there was something like a dome, shining like crystal spread out above their heads. Under the dome, their wings were stretched out and straight. I'm going to fast forward. Let's see. A voice from above the dome over their heads. You know, God's voice. And, then, and above the dome over their heads, there was something like a throne. In the appearance like sapphire, and seated above the likeness of a throne was something that seemed like a human form. So just like one side of the uh, v flying V is longer than the other, let's just take it for what it says. Um, Lift it up between heaven and earth. Uh, God makes the stars dark overhead. Uh, this is a, a vision that Daniel has about the tree uh, tall enough to touch heaven. And this isn't a vision, but the vision obviously coincides with everything else we've already covered. It would make no sense for the vision to be on a spinning ball in space. Uh, stars give off no light. Um, the moon stood still, the sun stood still. This is Habakkuk. And then uh, it also happens with Joshua as well. The star stopped over where the child was. So when Jesus was born, you know, we've all heard the story about the wise man and the star leading, you know, the wise men there. Well, how can a star, can you guys at nighttime say, well, that star that I see right there is directly over my friend Bill's house. But it's impossible. How can we know where these stars are? They're so high up there. So to me, one of these stars would have to come drastically lower to the ground, drastically lower to, stop, to be able to stop over a specific house to know that, oh, he's right there. So long story short, stars are certainly not uh, what we're taught they are. He showed him all the kingdoms of the world. Um, that's Satan taking Jesus up to a high mountain. Uh, the Son of Man returns on the clouds. This is another one of my favorites, too, as well. Future event, when uh, Jesus comes again in the future. So this is, you know, it seems like the order. So the sun and the moon go out. All the stars fall to the earth. So every single star, the Bible says, I don't know how many times, many times, that all of the stars are going to fall to the earth. And so just picture this. This is... It seems to be around about the time, I don't know if it's before or after, whatever, a massive earthquake. And so you better believe this is going to get every single person's attention. And then we're going to see him, you know, Jesus descending on the clouds just as he went uh, back in Acts uh, when he went up. Um, I think for a large portion of the people, they're going to be extremely excited. And the remainder will be extremely terrified when that happens. My opinion. Anyway, uh, joined by the armies of heaven, ascending and descending from heaven, Jesus ascending into and descending from heaven, Jesus came down from heaven, Jesus taken up in a cloud, Stephen looks up, up to heaven and sees the Father and Son. I mean, you see the redundancy here? A sheet with animals on it descends from heaven. This is in a vision as well. Uh, let's see, up, down, up to the third heaven. Jesus descends from heaven. All right, I want to skip ahead here. Rolled up like a scroll. I uh, already kind of talked about that. Threw it to the earth. A star falls to the earth. How are we doing on time, Joe? Okay, he raised his hand to heaven. Then up to heaven in a cloud. Man, it's just more and more and more. So, I guess... 
common themes in review. Let me skip ahead here, and I'll finish with this. Actually, whoa, let me skip way ahead. I don't got time to cover this. So navigation, just a simple what the navigation would lo look like with the compass, right? Well, wouldn't I go off some edge if I just headed west? Well, no, it's navigation like it's always worked, for instance. Magnetic north, the ice rebounder, boundary, series of strange events, cycles of the earth. Um, let's see. And I wanted to, so that's suggestions for sharing the book with people as well. Final thoughts to ponder. I'll finish with this. As they strained to see him rising into heaven, two white-robed men suddenly stood among them. Men of Galilee, they said, why are you standing here staring into heaven? Jesus has been taken up from you into heaven, but someday he will return from heaven in the same way you saw him go. And I really want to finish here. So interesting similarities. So the events that sur events around the time of Jesus' crucifixion, death, burial, and resurrection, and ascension, on the left, right here, obviously you can read that, and events around the time of Jesus' return in the future. So the sun is darkened uh, when he was crucified. The sun is darkened in the future. The veil is torn in the temple that was like a separation between us and God in the, in the, in the temple. The firmament is going to be torn in the future, that separation between us and God. There's a massive earthquake when Jesus was crucified, when he died. There's a massive earthquake in the future when he returns. Many saints were raised from the dead when he was resurrected, and all saints raised from the dead when he comes back. Jesus ascends to heaven on a cloud, uh, like I said in Acts 1, and Jesus descends from heaven on a cloud in the future. And at that time, God gathers his son, and in the future, God gathers the rest of his children. Just some interesting similarities I just wanted to throw in there at the end. Um, that's it. Ladies and gentlemen, Chad Taylor. Thank you, Chad. Thank you. I know you were rushed through that um, that that great book, but you know I want to encourage you guys to pick, take a look at that book over there. Um, there's just so much stuff in there, especially if, if you consider yourself uh, I'm pretty knowledgeable about the Bible. Um, when you read that book and you see what it actually says from a visual standpoint, um, if you're like me, you're gonna have your mind blown. So um, we're gonna.